I'm Chris Carter. This is the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Today, we're going to talk about the best case scenarios for how the board could fall in the first round to give the Steelers multiple great options at 20th overall pick. We'll talk about that with Brian Batko as well as will the Steelers give a fifth year extension to Najee Harris and Brian's big board of the top wide receivers the Steelers should be looking at in the first round. All that here and more on the North Shore Drive podcast. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast. A show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, joined by one of our great Steelers beat writers, Brian Batko. And it's the Friday episode here. We are now less than two weeks away. From the start of the NFL draft on April 25th. Actually, excuse me. Is that two weeks away? Yeah. I'm my math, my math is is, is good. We're good. It's, I'm it's on 412 day right now here in it is Pittsburgh. Four, so it is 412 day. 412 day to all those who celebrate. Certainly, and all the Penguins fans out there get getting getting a little bit more to celebrate as they continue their push for the playoffs with Sidney Crosby. We're, we're talking Steelers football here today. As always, this show is brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in the Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's Beer Bar, they have over 500 different available beers. 300 of those beers are from the local Pittsburgh area, and 80 of those local beers are available on tap at all times, and they're switching new ones in and out every single day. And Mike's Beer Bar is the best bar in Pittsburgh. When you get there, uh, tell them Chris sent you. We'll talk more about them later. Brian, you have an article coming out this weekend that kind of goes over how the board could break for the Steelers in the best way to give them multiple options at their positions of need and the positions they've been looking at closest with their pre-draft visits, combine, senior bowl, and all that. And I want us to go step by step through how you could how how it could break out. It doesn't mean it is this is how it is going to break out, but how certain other positions the Steelers may not really get a great chance at if there's a run there what that does for the pittsburgh steelers draft chances yeah uh do this every year this exercise the the best case mock draft usually comes out one week and then the worst case mock draft for the steelers comes out the next week if you've read it before thank you it's not necessarily my predictions on what's going to happen right but uh and and i will do a full first round nfl mock at some point but this is just hey what if all the other teams sort of act not unrealistically, but in a way that happens to be ideal for the Steelers, um, you know, with the positions that they need and where they could use the most depth in the draft? Absolutely. Let's get this started, actually. Let's let's, let's yeah. start going posi- uh, team by team here. The first overall pick is the Bears. You have that probably being Caleb Williams like everyone else. Yeah, I'll just save you the time. The, the three there quarterbacks, I think it's basically a given that they're going to go – one, two, three. And as we go through this too, Chris, it's more about players going to a specific slot before the Steelers are up. So if you want to imagine in your mind that it's a trade down for the Patriots and someone else comes up and picks Drake Mayer, Jaden Daniels third, fine. But it's just about those three going first, um, which would be the you know first positive domino for the Steelers, because I don't think any of us here anticipate them wanting to take a quarterback in the first round. Hmm, right. And then when you get to the Cardinals at fourth overall, they, they go wide receiver like many people are predicting, right? Well, not in this. I think the, the ideal for the Steelers would be if they surprise some people and take Dallas Turner, the edge rusher from Alabama. Because again, that, that you know, means... the Steelers, they're not going to be in the market for an outside linebacker in this first round. If other teams pluck those guys up higher, leave the receivers and the linemen for lower, that's good for the Steelers, obviously. I don't think Turner will go that high in real life, but, you know, it wouldn't be completely outlandish. And we've certainly seen crazier things happen. Um, I forget the name of the defensive lineman uh, that the uh, that the Raiders chose, the, the Steelers. Uh, Clellan Farrell from Clemson. Clellan yeah. Farrell. And, like, everyone's like, we didn't see that coming. And then all right. of a sudden, there's like, wow, Devin Bush is actually a possibility now. <laughs> um, so certainly things like that happen. All right, so you got the Chargers at five and the Giants at six. What happens there? So I think at, at five, the Chargers, if they stay there, really, it, it's it's a almost locked that they're going to take a receiver or a tackle, which would not be right. great for the Steelers. I've got them taking Joe Alt from Notre Dame, the Ooh. tackle. Um, and then at six with the Giants, I think this is another potential pivot point 
to benefit the Steelers, whether you think it's New York staying here or maybe Minnesota coming up. I've got J.J. McCarthy, the Michigan quarterback, going sixth, and that's going to push. That could be a domino effect on all the other QBs who are potential first-round candidates. Okay, okay. So in this scenario, uh, J.J. McCarthy, I have seen that, the Giants considering a McCarthy or a quarterback option there, or at least trading to someone who I mean, you, wants you that. See, you see people suggesting people somebody could trade up to four and take him. Yeah. So, you know, it's not not crazy to suggest that at all. No, it's not. But now you're sitting here at seven, and the Titans are doing backflips because they got Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors to choose from. And a tackle. And that's where I'm going to say, again, you can't really avoid, uh, you know, neither one of the top two tackles, I think, are going to have any chance of falling all the way to the Steelers at 20. So I've actually got the Titans taking Olu Fashionu from Penn State uh, to, to protect Will Levis and give him time to throw to all those receivers they got this offseason. All right, so uh, now you got me just just flexing. I'm like, like, okay, where the heck is Marvin Harrison Jr. going, Brian? Yeah, I mean, it seems too low for him, but if there's a school of thought around the league that, hey, this receiver class is so deep, we don't necessarily need to reach and take him. There also could be some debate between him and Malik Neighbors. You see that from some of the draft analysts at times. And I'll just take it to pick eight right now. I think probably the the team least likely to look to the offensive side of the ball in the first round would be the Atlanta Falcons because of all the help they need on defense, all that they've invested in running back receiver tight end while Arthur Smith was down there. I say they take Jared verse Florida state edge rusher in the Whoa. best case scenario for the Steelers. All right. All right. Now the bears are back up. They got to take Marvin Harrison. Yes, Jr. They right? have to take Marvin Harrison okay. jr. They would be doing backflips. He and Caleb Williams <laughs> and everybody uh, you know, in, in middle America there, if, if this would come to pass. Absolutely. So, okay. The jets here though, do they, do they follow the wide receiver path here or maybe they get like Brock Bowers here as a different kind of option? Yeah, I, I considered that, but I think again, you know, Marvin Harrison jr. Can't mm -hmm. really fall any lower than nine. And I don't think Malik neighbors can fall out of the top 10 with the production and the tape and everything that he's got coming out of LSU. So that, you know, those two receivers going certainly weakens the pull, but much like the linemen, nobody has any uh, designs on the Steelers ending up with those guys. So right. they have to get picked eventually. If they, you know, if those two guys last to nine and 10, that's going to have a great trickle down effect on the receivers who should be available, not just in the end of the first round, but throughout the draft. So I'm right with you. So top 10, you have two wide receivers, two edge rushers, two tackles, and four quarterbacks. Break it, break it down there. I think the next run of teams here, there's like there's four straight teams that could that could legitimately take a, a quarterback. Not that they all would, but yeah, I, I look at the Vikings, the Broncos, the Raiders, the Saints, all with legitimate needs there. And this is where you'd start to see are they that thirsty for Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. In your scenario, are they is that is that one of the best case scenarios there for the Steelers that they actually do take those teams, those the one of those two of those players? Oh, yeah, you're on the same wavelength as me, Chris. And and for people at home watching, you know, you haven't seen this because it's coming out, uh, it's gonna be in the Sunday paper. I'm not sure when it's gonna be online, but yeah, you're going blind off this and uh, you're picking up what I'm putting down. I think this is the sort of section of the draft that can most help the Steelers if it falls a certain way. I've got the Vikings taking Quinion Mitchell, the Toledo cornerback. Okay. They could easily go quarterback, of course, but I don't have them doing that because I've got the Broncos and Raiders both going with QBs. Ooh. Denver takes Bo Nix. Let's just say Sean Payton is in love with him. And Vegas takes Michael Penix Jr. Let's just say they want to kickstart their rebuild with a, a guy from out there on the West Coast. So th those are probably the highest that either one of those could go, but – We've seen the NFL get quarterback fever at times, and certainly if six go in the top 13, uh, you know, teams that addressed it through trades and free agency like the Steelers will be fe feeling very good about who's going to be available to them when they pick. So that's now you're at pit by pick 13 in this best case scenario draft. You have five quarterbacks off the board here. I six. have seen Bo Nix linked to the Broncos quite a few times. So, like, there's yeah, it's, you know, that's what I mean. It's it's probably not going to unfold that way, but. I think it's within the realm of possibility, and it's actually six quarterbacks, the big three, McCarthy. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, McCarthy. Penix. Six yeah. With, with Penix, yeah. Jeez. So six of the top 13 picks in your in your in your class here, in your in your scenario here, uh are, are quarterbacks here at 14. Is that where Roma Dunze goes? Not quite yet. I've got the Saints taking Byron Murphy, the second Texas D tackle oh. 
as good as he is and as much as the Steelers kind of have a need for replenishing the defensive line depth, I don't think they're really going to be interested in him at 20 overall. So I consider that another best case scenario pick for the Steelers. And then I've got Roma Dunze from Washington going to the Colts at 50. Gotcha. All right, cool. So now we're at 15. <clears throat> we got we got th- four more picks until that we set up the Steelers board, and then we'll take a break. Real quick for me, who you got the Seahawks, Jaguars, Bengals, and Rams taking? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think <laughs> most likely you're going to get to that third offensive lineman at some mm-hmm. point. But the whole premise of this exercise is what if you don't? What if the Seahawks want Chop Robinson, the edge rusher from Penn State, who's super athletic? He's going to, you know, some people love him. Some people were fading him in this draft but remember they've got baltimore ravens d coordinator mike mcdonald up there now as the head coach might want to spark some things on defense with chop robinson jaguars nate wiggins clemson quarterback for all we know the steelers might love him they had him in for a pre-draft visit he's got crazy long speed they went down to the clemson pro day as usual but uh this is all about getting a tackle or a center to the steel or even a possibly a wide receiver bengals i've got him taking brock bowers tight end from georgia Highly doubt he falls that far. He could be a uh, you know best player at his position in a while in the draft, but mm-hmm. I don't think the Steelers would take him in the first round. And then at 19, Rams, they seem destined to go defense. I have them selecting Liatu Latu from uh, UCLA, edge rusher. So the people who'd be left on the board, Chris, for the Steelers, J.C. Latham, Amarius Mims, Taliesa Fuaga, Troy Whoa. Fautanu, Whoa. Liam Barton, Jackson Powers Johnson, even Brian Thomas Jr., LSU wide receiver and even a couple corners and Cooper DeGene and Terry on Arnold, that would just be uh that, that'd be heaven for Omar Khan and the Steelers. The only issue would be the indec- indecision maybe uh, of what to do with all those targets. I, I'm with you there. Let's explore those topics a little bit, cl- targets a little bit closer here on the next segment of the, of the North Shore Drive podcast before we roll into our other the topics of discussion. But first, I want to remind you this show is brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar all of Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's Beer Bar, it's right on Federal Street, right across the street from PNC Park. It's the best place to go before, during, and after Pirates games, whether they're on the road or at, at home. You go to Mike's Beer Bar. They have over 500 different available beers. 300 of those beers are from the local Pittsburgh area, and 80 of those local beers are available on tap, and they're always switching new ones in and out. Whether you like Hefeweizen, Stouts, IPAs, Sours, they have your types of beer beer there. And if you have if you have a favorite brewery in town, most likely they're at Mike's Beer Bar too. So go check out Mike's Beer Bar for that. And also, they have over 20 televisions. So whether you want to catch the Buckos or another MLB game, or you just want to follow the NHL playoffs as they're getting set up, the NBA playoffs that they're getting set up there's all the different things that you can track there as well as the upcoming live draft show that we're going to be at while brian and ray and jerry at the the team facility i'll I'll be there with adam bittner and and other guests that we have there on mike's beer bar on april 25th thursday night as well as april 26th on the friday night uh on the first two days of the draft join us there at mike's beer bar the best bar of pittsburgh go to mike's beer bar today when you get there tell them chris said you We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Batko. Okay, let's run through the list of names here that are still available, uh, Brian. You still have Jerzon Newton, by the way, defensive tackle out of Illinois, which finding an, an, a new young stud to pair with Keanu Benton would be a need. Now, it ranks well behind the other needs that the Steelers have, but that's an interesting player to have there. But let's look at corner. Let's look at offensive tackle. And let's look at the interior offensive of, uh, of linemen that, that, are, that are left over in your best case scenario uh, there. And again, just a reminder with with this, this is not what Brian saying is going to happen. This is like a, 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 a in, in an extreme scenario where like this is this is the way you kind of want the uh, they're closer to what you want to see the direction break. Yeah, you I'm, take it in totality. Very unlikely that only two tackles are going to go right, in the first right. nineteen picks. But when you look at each individual pick, um, you know, in a vacuum. You can kind of make a case for why you know certain teams would make some of the picks that we've mentioned already. And I do research this through like the databases that include right. sort of the range for players, where they could go, where they could not, you know, where they could fall to, um, what you know teams beat writers are predicting. So I'm not just going in there com- completely blind. Uh, I'm trying no, to keep, of course not. Yeah, trying to keep some level of uh, you know w- w- what's the word I'm looking for? I guess rationality uh, mm-hmm. with what we do here. So you got six quarterbacks. The best case scenario, Chris, would be if the uh, 20, 19 punters go 
before number <laughs> 20 course. for the Steelers. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but don't they need a punter? Um, <laughs> 19 uh, but, kickers and <laughs> long snappers. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, it, but again, again you, so you got six quarterbacks, three edge rushers, three wide receivers, Two corners, a defense, and a, and a defensive lineman, and a tight end among your among your top nineteen picks here in this best case scenario. So again, if we isolate it to just the three top positions, in fact, I'll include four with wide receiver. Yeah, so, you could. I mean, that's the beauty of how this board would unfold for the Steelers. You could go in whatever direction is your flavor for for what you think they need the most in this draft, or player for that matter. So <clears throat> corner wise, you have Cooper DeJean, you have Terry on Arnold, you have Kool-Aid McKinstry. All three of those guys are players. The Steelers have taken a, a closer look at Cooper DeJean now scheduled for a top 30 visit. Uh, that might even happen uh, to later today as we're recording. And all, and all this. three kind of have the kind of versatility that I, I think that the mm-hmm. Steelers could use right now in the secondary is as, as good as Quinion Mitchell and Nate Wiggins could be as pure line them up outside corners. You know, the Steelers already have that guy and Joey Porter Jr. I, I think they could, benefit from somebody who could play outside play the slot maybe even roll over to safety at times uh, and this is that's definitely cooper DeGene's profile a lot of yep. people even talk about him like he is a safety but then let's flip to to offensive tackle you got talisa fuaga troy fatanu and amarius mims and jc latham all sitting there that is the smorgasbord of big dudes like yeah. like it is just it is huge. That, 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 that's huge. At this point, to be honest, Brian, I know some, you, you're, you're probably thinking, we'll take we'll take anybody. Like if if it broke like this, where even say three, two, two of these tackles and two of these corners are here. If I'm the Steelers, I might consider trading back a few picks just so I can recoup maybe another day two pick and still get one of the, one of these guys. Yeah, you could trade down, of course. Uh, that's that's always the case, and that's always part of this. Uh, endeavor as well is that it shows you not just how things could line up for the Steelers perfectly in the first round, but obviously the effect that it would have, you know, for your needs throughout the draft. Like again, a deep wide receivers class is barely getting picked over uh, before you're even on the clock for the first time. Same thing at tackle, same thing at center. Um, so it, you know, it, it can't necessarily continue that way forever throughout the draft, but you know, again, Short of the twenty, the nineteen worst draft eligible players being picked before the Steelers are up at number twenty. I, I mean, I think if if teams deem some of these edge rushers better uh, than you know the outside media seems to think, or um, you know some of these quarterbacks, certainly you never really know what's going to happen there. I mean, we've seen in recent years it's just as likely that all the JJ McCarthy hype could be a smokescreen put out there by you know teams or. Uh, mm-hmm. or front offices or whatever, and, and maybe he'll last well into the first round, and maybe Knicks and Penix will be the next. Uh, was it last year that Will Levis – did Will Levis go in the second round, or was he – In the second, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, you, know, you always sometimes see those guys, uh, you know, in danger of slipping entirely. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is an area where the Steelers would be – their needs are at least what we think they view their needs as, and I think a lot of the times their pro day circuit and, you know, certainly the pre-draft visits – signal to us whether we're on the same page as them and with all the tackles all the receivers even a, a couple of the centers uh that, that they've been hosting on the south side it's it's no secret what the Steelers are after and where they think they need to improve and upgrade so yeah if you have all those you know all but the top two tackles still on the board you know for all we know Mike Tomlin and, and Omar Khan and Andy Weidel love JC Latham over everybody else or <clears throat> maybe they love Jackson Powers Johnson and say we can still get a pretty good tackle in the second round or receiver or what have you. In, okay, just for your for your your you are Omar Khan and Mike Tomlin in the war room. It's draft night. This is the board and how it fell. Who and, and you're not trading back. Who would be your pick? Oh, come on, Chris. I was just putting the options out there. I wasn't <laughs> trying to sit in the GM chair, but uh, no, I, I think I'd probably take J.C. Latham. I mean, he okay. seems the guy of of this list who seems least likely to fall all the way to 20. But <clears throat> you do hear some rumblings about him. Like, why didn't he do any of the athletic testing at the combine? Why did he only do positional drills at his pro day? Is he a little bit on the heavy side? Are you going to have to worry about his weight at the next level? And, and one interesting thing to file away if, if you're hoping that the Steelers would um, would be able to land Latham there's a, a fundamental difference, I think, between the value for somebody like Latham or Mims or Fuaga, for that matter, to the Steelers versus a lot of other teams around the league because of 
getting Broderick Jones and trading up for him last year, they need a right tackle more yeah. than most. Other teams I are going to look at Latham, Mims, Fuaga and say, man, their right tackle tape in college is really good. We think they could flip over to the left side for us if that's what we need. And, you know, you generally want to use those premium picks on guys protecting the blind side, but it's still a bit of a projection. Maybe we'll go a safer route with somebody else, but that could play right into the Steelers' hands if uh, you know if that hurts the value of one of those three guys and allows them to slip all the way to twenty. Could be a, a perfect positional fit for the Steelers, allowing them to flip Jones over to the left side and sort of let Dan Moore, uh, you know, fight for his job at one spot or another. Absolutely, I think that I think that that's something that could work out in the Steelers' favor. And another best case scenario. When we come back, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to ask, I want to ask Brian back about the potential of extending Najee Harris and a closer look at his uh, how he built his big board of wide receivers for the Steelers to look at in, in the first round and beyond. All here in the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Back, go stick with us. We'll be right back. We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast on the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Batko. Brian, we did a lot of draft talk. Let's take a quick reprieve before we dive right back into it. But I wanted to ask you about Najee Harris. He, he He's due his fifth-year extension if the Steelers were to give it to him. I believe it's well, it's May. What's the de- what's the deadline for them to choose? May, May 2. Yeah, May, May 2nd. So about a week so, after the draft. So, so yeah, like a, a, literally <clears> a week <throat> after the draft starts and they haven't made this decision yet. It, and it, they normally thing, don't. I mean, they usually take it right up to the deadline because right. why not? I mean, it doesn't. That deadline spur action, right? We're in the journalism industry. We know that as well as anybody. This is very, this is very true. Mm-hmm. And they've also been very busy this off season. Like yeah. you know, compared to most, like back in the Ben Roethlisberger days, they weren't this active in free agency. They weren't, they weren't this active in trades most years. And then on top of the draft process that they that they that they took on, um, I think that this is certainly a year where they've been very busy. Do you foresee a, a, a resunning happen here? I think the projections right now are it would be a six point seven million dollar extension for a fifth year, yeah. which would be the twenty twenty five season, not the twenty twenty four season. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm writing about this for our positional analysis series, which I think we've only got two left before the draft. Running back, it's it's one of the more cut and dried cases. So the only thing that really is, I mean, we know the Najee Harris, Jalen Warren combo is good, arguably the best in the league. I think there were only two other teams uh, who's uh, who had two backs in the top 28 in rushing last year, the Lions and the Dolphins. So yeah, I mean, these guys are they, they complement each other well. Uh, they're, they're a great backfield duo right now. The the only question that's really more controversial is how long do you keep them together and and why and how do you go about doing it? And obviously that fifth-year option for Najee Harris is is going to be the first um, you know, pivot point there. I, I, I think the Steelers will pick that up because of how strong he finished the season. And again, I think he, his hard running makes Jalen Warren better as well. And with Arthur Smith coming in here, he might even be more of a focal point in the offense. So, I mean, that is how I see it. But are there some things that give you a little bit of pause? Maybe. I mean, he hasn't been a home run hitter by any stretch. His longest mm-hmm. run last season was 25 yards. And I don't think he's even had a 40-yard play from scrimmage in his three-year career. So we know he's more of a grinder. We know he's more of an innings eater, to use a baseball term there. Uh, he does it well. He's got a nose for the end zone. He rarely fumbles. He's reliable. But at what point does the sort of consistency and lack of, uh, you know, dynamic running hold you back from committing a certain salary to him? I, you know, that'd be a top 10 salary for running backs this year in terms of the cap hit. Do you think he's worth that? I mean, that that's really what it's going to come down to for the Steelers. But they've got a pretty cheap offense, which probably helps Najee in that regard. But you're also forecasting and projecting because you don't know what your quarterbacks are going to cost you next year. You've got Russell Wilson on the vet minimum for this year. You've got Justin Fields with his own fifth year option decision that I think is an obvious one that you're not going to pick up, but if he gets in there and plays well, you're going to have a whole other equation on your hands. So, and and then the only, the only other thing I'll say about Najee Harris, Chris is as stable and reliable and dependable as he's been on the field. He hasn't always said, some of the right things off the field. There have been a couple of times where you're, I think you raise your eyebrows and say, hmm, that's it's a little strange that he's going there. Um, after the Bills game comes to mind, talking about the discipline on the team, lack of in-house rules that need to be better. And he was complimentary of Mike Tomlin, but 
just didn't sound like a guy who was real pleased with the overall trajectory of things. And I still look back to being a team captain in 2022 and, and all the talk of cultivating leadership with him and Mike Tomlin being over the moon about how he was stepping up in that regard. And then in 2023, he's not a team captain anymore. I mean, those are just some of the sort of, you know, less significant aspects of a player that just makes me wonder like, okay, is, is everything all uh, sunshines and rainbows with this relationship or, you know, do they not necessarily want to, uh, uh, you know, use that extra fifth year, whether it's from Najee's end or from the Steelers end, do you want to take another season, see how it plays out. And then you could always go back to the negotiating table if you want. Certainly would be interesting to see how that plays out. And, and I don't see them my- extending him either, Chris, because just that, it doesn't really seem like smart business with running backs in today's day and age, especially with all the touches he's gotten. It's it's cold, it's ruthless, it's brutal. Najee's talked about that himself, you know, well before his own. And the Steelers are showing they believe in positional value, and positional value does not look at running backs as a, as a position that you pay big money to. Exactly. And, and picking him in the first round, that was the Kevin Colbert regime. I think Omar Khan looks at things a little bit more analytically. And, you know, Jalen Warren is proof – right on their roster that sometimes you can get gems in in the late rounds or even undrafted. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know that uh, they'll, they'll want to jump right back into signing a long-term deal with a guy who's got a lot of tread off the tires and as good as he's been, he's taken a lot of hits. So you, you've got a, you've got an obligation to the organization first and foremost, even though I'm sure they're appreciative of, uh, of the work ethic and the will to win and will to prepare to win that Najee's brought to the table these three years. Let's take a look here at your wide receiver big board that is, that is now available with the Post Gazette Steelers draft big board, where myself, you, and Ray Fittipato have all contributed to with different positions. You broke down wide receivers. Walk us through your rankings here and where you see them being the best fits for the Steelers need at getting an, a wide receiver to pair with George Pickens. Yeah, I've expanded the rankings since uh, since we started this big board in January or February because they traded Deontay Johnson to Carolina. So I think receivers just become a much much more of a priority for them in this draft possibly even as high as the first round as we discussed in the first uh first segment there but uh, I've now got Adonai Mitchell from ten, uh from Texas AD Mitchell in my number one slot mainly because I think it's very unlikely despite my ideal first round scenario that Marvin Harrison Malik neighbors Roma Dunze or even Brian Thomas jr from LSU would be there at 20. So I think the list really for the Steelers kind of starts with that next tier of guys. And I'd put Mitchell at the top there, but he's probably not going to uh, last much past 20. So I think you'd have to use your first round pick on him if you're going to get him. They brought him in for a visit. So we know there is some interest. One interesting note on him, Chris, is, um, you know, I, I think you you kind of have to consider the dynamic in the room with George Pickens finally being elevated to that clear cut number one guy. He and Mitchell are are close. I mean, they became friends at Georgia. Mitchell transferred to Texas from Athens. So, I mean, Pickens has said that he thinks Mitchell could be the next him uh, at Georgia. Obviously, things went a different direction for Mitchell's, uh, you know, college career. But maybe those two guys would get along really well. And, you know, I'd say the same thing for the number two guy on my board here. Lad McConkey has already played with Pickens at Georgia, has already been in kind of a run first offense. I think he's a guy who would understand that the targets will come when they come and you got to make the most of them. I'd say the same for number three on my list, Roman Wilson. You're seeing a theme uh, from Michigan, not the biggest guy in the draft, not the most productive, but uh, I think he would, he would do the dirty work. He comes from a winning program, the reigning national champs. Uh, He's somebody who I think would seamlessly fit into this offense as well. Certainly. I I think it's going to be interesting to see, you know, again, you know, Again, you're not predicting that that's exactly that's how the board's going to fall as far as the wide receivers. But like, who are the who would be the most tempting of the wide receivers to fall to the Steelers if Brian Thomas would be available? They talked to him at the combine. He certainly he led he led all of college football with with touchdown receptions. He's also one of the best deep threats in college football of the past year. You know, getting that on a team where you know I talk I've talked about how both uh, Russell Wilson and Justin Fields, if you looked at their passer rating, their passer rating was at its best when they were throwing the deep ball last year, uh, look, looking at looking at their their targets. Uh, so would getting a guy like that behoove them? But again, weighing that against getting a, a first-round corner or a first-round tackle, when you look at the guys that you have listed here, like you and I have talked about, we both like Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall, Mal- Mal- Malachi Corley. 
any of those guys in the second round or Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina, those would all be guys that would be plug and play. And, and like they start off as number two options to George Pickens, but those are all guys that could develop into number one options for, for the, for the Steelers in the long run. And then you still have guys like Jalen Polk, who's another big, big, deep, deep, big, big time, deep threat uh, out there. And again, that's just the top 10 wide receivers. This is a draft class where there's probably going to be 20 wide receivers that people are looking at as like, Hey, that guy could be a real problem for defenses to cover in the NFL. And you're seeing, the reaction to that around the league, I think. I mean, the Niners are are dragging their feet and paying Brandon Ayuk. You know, the yep. Bengals are avoiding doing that with T. Higgins and possibly shopping him. The 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 Bills did shop and trade Stephon Diggs mm-hmm. to the Texans. I mean, I just think there's so many teams and GMs right now and scouting departments who are really thinking the same way we are with this receiver class. And you know, it, it's it's interesting how that's affected the movement of veteran receivers. The Steelers being one of them. With Deontay Johnson, I think we all know they weren't going to pay him uh, again for for his services beyond next season. So you at least get out from under that contract while getting something in exchange instead of letting him walk for nothing and even dealing with the whole potential hold-in situation again if he was going to go that route. But I also do wonder how is it going to affect the stock of the receivers in this particular draft? I mean, I, I still think that prospects like Harrison and Neighbors and Adunze and Thomas are so good that somebody is going to be enamored with them and take them in the top 20. But, you know, if not, is there a, a little bit of a, you know, a trickle down effect? Could, could AD Mitchell be there in the second round for the Steelers or at least fall to a place where maybe they trade up for him? I think that's the only way he would land here. Otherwise, yeah, I'm standing pat at 51 and, you know, I'm kind of scanning the board and seeing who's still left, whether that is a, Wilson, Pearsall, Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky, you know, Xavier Worthy from Texas lit up the 40 yard dash. We'll see how high that pushes him up in the draft. You know, even sort of down the line guys like Devontae Walker from UNC has a lot to like. Jalen Polk was in an explosive offense at Washington. Keon Coleman has some highlight reel catches at, at Florida State. I mean, you can just go on and on and on. Uh, Bittner and I have talked about Brendan Rice on the mock draft tracker. From USC. So, yeah, I just really think that, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of teams who they're going to come away from this draft with a a rookie receiver who they are ready to plug and play from day one. And, you know, not only do you get younger, possibly more athletic, possibly more dynamic in your receiving core right away, but you also start taking advantage of those guys before they get to the point where they're commanding Stefan Diggs, T. Higgins, Brandon Ayuk money later on in their career if they pan out. Absolutely. He's Brian Batko of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. You can find all his work at post-gazette.com, whether it's his upcoming best-case scenario mock draft where the Steelers could get several things to work in their favor to give them a, a smorgasbord of options in the first round, as well as all of our big board big, big board predictions or big board outlook on this NFL draft class. Of several and, we, and we can talk oh. about the worst case next week. We'll be we sad. Will talk we'll, play, we'll play sad trombone. We'll <laughs> strum a tiny violin when all these guys go before the Steelers. Are at twenty. That will be that'll be just as fun in a more uh, you know dark kind of way. Yeah, cer- certainly. But the, again, the point of these exercises are to go to fun, to go between the different extremes to find the the medium that usually this falls into to to look at what the Steelers could do. Again, he's Brian Batko. I'm Chris Carter. We're both of the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Read our work at post gazettecom Find us here on the Nor- on the North Shore Drive podcast on on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Remember, the North Shore Drive podcast is every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, but you can also catch all the daily content that comes out from all of our Pittsburgh sports writers across the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Back Monday with more here on the North Shore Drive Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive Podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all the sports coverage from the Post-Gazette that we have to offer, visit post-gazette.com.